The horror genre has come a long way in video games. What started with harmless, creepy vampire slaying games have progressed into the literal stuff of nightmares that quite honestly require a change of pants if you catch my drift. The indie horror gaming community in particular has grown exponentially within the past decade. But why? What games were responsible for this massive rise in indie horror development? Being the curious person that I am, I decided to do a little research into the history behind indie horror games in recent history. Many jump scares, nightmares, and sleepless nights later, I have come up with the five horror games that I believe have had the most influence in changing the indie horror community into what it is today. The games on this list are not ordered by level of importance. Each one has had a drastic effect on the horror community in their own way, so I felt it wouldn't be fair or accurate to try to compare them. Instead, I've ordered them by release date, from oldest to newest. Oh, and of course, this list is just my opinion. Before we get started on this horrific history lesson through indie gaming, please be sure to hit the like button and subscribe if you're new. Or, um, bad things will happen. Secure, contain, protect. Founded in 2008, the lore behind the SCP Foundation community is extensive and ever-growing. The fictional organization's mission is to locate and contain unnatural anomalies. These anomalies can range from monsters, to physics-defying objects, to moving statues, to indestructible giant lizards, to sentient computers, and to... um, this dude. All of these anomalies are called SCPs and are separated into multiple categories depending on the level of threat they pose to society. Some are relatively harmless, while others can literally cause the extinction of the human race. Fun stuff. Oh, and some of them are just plain weird. I mean, there's one SCP called the Butt Ghost. There are literally thousands of documented SCPs, all of which were created by dedicated members of the SCP fandom. So in a perfect world, the SCP Foundation would keep the most dangerous threats to society under lock and key, never again to see the light of day. But what if they did get out? The game SCP Containment Breach, created in April of 2012, explores a scenario in which some of the most dangerous SCPs break out of their containment and wreak havoc trying to find a way to escape the Foundation. Or not. Some of the escaped SCPs just want to hang out and chill, but that doesn't make them any less creepy. Or dangerous. Over the years, Containment Breach has been continuously updated by its development team, and as of today, you can find over 30 SCPs, all with their own unique game mechanics and personality. So, needless to say, there's a lot of stuff that can kill you. With a randomized map and multiple endings, you would have to spend days playing the game if you wanted to explore every SCP-related Easter egg this game has to offer. There are many fan games covering the numerous SCPs that exist, most of which uh, actually only cover one SCP, but as the first and most popular fan game, Containment Breach remains the gold standard for games covering the SCP fandom. In regards to its contribution, Containment Breach helped to popularize the indie horror game genre. Now, this was back in 2012 when indie horror games were few and far between. They were around, but not to the extent that they are today. In the same fashion as the creepypasta fandom, the SCP organization helped to inspire horror developers by giving them new ideas and new monsters to work with. Even today, the SCP fandom continues to hold influence on the indie horror space, with the occasional SCP fan game and even a recreation of the original SCP Containment Breach game on the Unity engine. Slenderman first surfaced in June of 2009 on the Something Awful Internet Forum in a series of monochrome images. These images depicted groups of children accompanied by a tall, thin, faceless man in a suit dubbed the Slender Man. As if that wasn't creepy enough, additional text was supplemented to the pictures, providing a horrifying background suggesting the disappearance of the children. From there, the Slender Man went viral in the horror community, leading to fan art videos and creepypasta horror stories that added to the mythos, allowing this new monster to take shape. Probably the most influential additions to the legend came from Marble Hornets, a YouTube channel dedicated to unraveling the mysteries of Slender Man and, well, um, trying not to die. Several other YouTube channels followed suit, furthering the Slender Man lore, most notably Everyman Hybrid, Tribe 12, and Dark Harvest. 
Slender the Eight Pages was the first Slender Man horror game to rise out of the indie game community in the wake of the Slender Man popularity. And let me tell you, Slender was terrifying. The game's design was simple, run around and grab the pages, don't get caught by Slender Man. But with the way that Slendy moved about the map, the horror was intense and effective. You'll be walking along, not a care in the world, and then BAM! Terrified gamers began uploading their reactions to YouTube and Slender the Eight Pages quickly turned into an internet challenge. Who is brave enough to play this game? At the height of Slenderman's popularity came a plethora of fan games based both on the Slenderman lore and Slender the Eight Pages. Probably the most notable example was Slender the Arrival, which was released back in 2014. There's Slendy Tubbies too, but that game has evolved into its own, uh, thing. Since then, Slendy has been a go-to creepypasta horror villain in various indie games, both good and bad. Like SCP Containment Breach, Slender the Eight Pages helped to popularize the small indie horror game genre as a whole. Indie PC gaming at the time was primed and ready for the horror genre, Slender Man or not, but the game's contribution in sparking interest in the YouTube space was instrumental in the enormous waves of horror game Let's Players that we still see today. If you want to explore the history of .exes, it doesn't actually start with the first .exe game. Rather, it starts with the horror stories called creepypastas. Creepypasta stories can be dated back to the early 2000s, so really they've been around almost since the birth of the internet. Of particular interest to gamers have been creepypastas related to video games. These stories included Ben Drowned, Lost Silver, The Theater, and yes, Sonic.exe. The actual story of Sonic.exe was a creepypasta created in 2011 about a guy who was playing a disturbed Sonic game his friend sent him. The game Sonic.exe was created two years later in 2013 and was meant to act as the actual game from the story. The game was only made in three days and was never meant to be taken seriously as a true horror game, but soon it started to gain some attention, likely due to the popularity of the original creepypasta from which it was based. In May of 2013, PewDiePie uploaded a playthrough of the game and Sonic.exe blew up. Reaction and gameplay videos were everywhere on YouTube, and with any successful game, there are sure to be copies. More creepypasta games began to hit the indie horror scene, many of which had the tag of .exe at the end of their name as to relate themselves to Sonic.exe. Over time, developers stopped basing their games on creepypasta stories and instead focused on what classic video game has not been touched by the .exe craze. Mario.exe? Try Yoshi.exe. Sonic.exe? More like Big the Cat.exe. Yeah, .exe games have gotten a little out of hand. There's a lot of them out there, but maybe only 5% can be considered good games. Sonic.exe's main contribution to the indie world was the way the game broke the fourth wall. Breaking the fourth wall wasn't exactly a new concept in video games, and it was actually pretty common to see the characters on the screen talk about, or directly to, the player. Sonic.exe took it a step further and called out the player by name. Oh, the horror! What the game was really doing was looking at the name of the computer and including the text into the final screen. But when you see your name pop up in a horror game and you didn't expect it, you're gonna have that split moment of, wait, this isn't real. Is it? PT stands for Playable Teaser and was, well, a playable teaser released in 2014 for the game Silent Hills, an upcoming PlayStation horror game in the Silent Hill series. Featuring Walking Dead heartthrob Norman Reedus! Although the game was just a teaser, it was a true horror experience with an interesting twist not often seen in horror games at that time. The game consisted of the player repeatedly wandering the same hallway, all the while being haunted by one ghastly ghost of a woman who may or may not have terrified you to the core. Seriously, she would just come out of nowhere and the jump scares were just not predictable, which is what helped to make this a top rated horror game. In just one short month after PT was released on the PlayStation Network, the game was downloaded a whopping one million times. Fans were falling over themselves in anticipation for the release of Silent Hills. 
However, despite the enormous success of the teaser, the Silent Hills game was cancelled for unclear reasons and PT was removed from the PlayStation Network not even a year after its release. Heartbroken indie developers began creating remakes and fan games alike in honor of the fallen horror gem of a game. Even all the way in 2019, we are still seeing brand new fan games replicating the PT hallway. PT's effect on indie horror development was subtle, yet powerful. First, it popularized the concept of repetition in horror games, where the player would wander around the same location over and over, experiencing new and unexpected horrors upon each bout. We also soon began to see a rise in horror games with a focus on psychological domestic horror. These games called into question the main playable character's mental stability as they were slowly but surely driven into madness by the horrors they were forced to experience. All within the comfort of their own home. Am I just seeing things? Or is there really a woman following me? Oh my god! Examples of these types of games are Allison Road and Visage, both of which retain the same feelings of terror and familiarity that were provided by P.T. Horror enthusiasts have always been fascinated by the combination of childhood and horror. So why not make a game about child murder set in a rundown Chuck E. Cheese? In 2014, indie gaming went through a sort of horror renaissance. With popular gaming YouTubers diving into horror games left and right, developers were pushing themselves to find new ways to terrify gamers. Five Nights at Freddy's dropped in the middle of this horror renaissance. Starting with John Wolf, previously known as Harshly Critical, the demo of Five Nights at Freddy's slowly made its way around the YouTube horror community. By the time Markiplier played the game, Five Nights at Freddy's had struck a chord with the YouTube audience. With Five Nights at Freddy's 2 and 3 following up only months later, FNAF Mania reached an all-time high. T-shirts, plushies, lunchboxes, backpacks, fan art, animations, an in-depth lore analysis, and fan games. Oh, the fan games. Five Nights at Wario's, Five Nights at Treasure Island, Five Nights with Mac Tonight, Day Shift at Freddy's 1, 2, and 3, Super FNAF, Five Nights Before Freddy's, Five Nights with 39, Five Nights at Candy's, One Night at Plumpy's 1 and 2, Five Nights at the Krusty Krab, Five Nights at the Chum Bucket, Five Nights at Team Rocket Headquarters, Dormitibus, The Joy of Creation, Pop Goes, Jollibees, Five Nights at... Well, you get the idea. So the effect that Five Nights at Freddy's had on the indie game community is pretty obvious, right? There are so many Five Nights at Freddy's fan games that they got their own tab on Game Jolt. Although it wasn't necessarily a new concept, many other horror indie games began to adopt this idea of sitting and waiting for a monster rather than just running away like a coward. Sit down and close the door like a man. Essentially, Five Nights at Freddy's had helped to create a horror subgenre all of its own. So those are what I believe to be the five most influential horror games on the indie game community in recent years. Did you agree with my research? It's okay if you didn't, this is all just my opinion. Really, every indie horror game ever created has had some sort of influence on the genre, big or small. One of the main purposes of this video was to give you a brief history lesson of some of the more important horror games, and how even one game can send waves of change across a community, and ultimately, make the world a better and scarier place. That's all for now! Please be sure to hit the like button and subscribe if you're new! Oh! And let me know what you thought of the video in the comments below. Thank you all so much for watching. Go out there and make someone's day. Be happy, stay happy. I'll see you guys later. Goodbye.